I'm John Britton, and I'm going to uh, shift the conversation up the uh, grade level from K through 12 to the subject of higher education, and particularly the plight of historically black colleges and universities. I begin with a question. Are the vestiges from the past de jure segregation traceable to state-supported historically black colleges and universities, or commonly known as HBCUs, or HBIs, thus making them unequal? I answer my question in the positive that yes, 60 years after Brown versus the Board of Education, HBCUs are not as competitive and comparable with their surrounding traditional white institutions of higher education known as TWIs. First, I'll give you a little history, then I'll give you a little law, and finally, I'll come to a conclusion with some remedies. History. The vestiges of uh, Jim Crow segregation continue at state-supported historically black colleges and universities. Like their counterparts at the K through 12 grade school level, the HBCUs once operated de jure segregated institutions uh, based upon race, uh, from the colored schools, quote unquote, to the white schools. But unlike these K through 12, which went through desegregation through court enforcement, the HBCUs largely avoided that remedy. They avoided the remedy uh, in part because the lack of enforcement by civil rights organizations and by the federal government, but they also, in many instances, wanted to avoid it because they saw some of the disadvantages of integration in K through 12 schools where mostly black schools were closed or they were merged with traditional white institutions and many black administrators uh, from superintendents and principals and others and teachers were eventually fired or they were disproportionately not hired. And so the HBCUs were also considered voluntary admission, whereas K through 12 was subject to compulsory school attendance. And consequently, the law said that the uh, segregation was uh, largely a result of self-identification and self-affinity. Some civil rights advocates attempted to reduce the educational disparities nevertheless uh, between the HBCUs and the TWIs uh, by demanding in a case called Adams versus Richardson around 1968 that the then United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare enforce Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination uh, based upon race among covered categories for the recipient of federal funds. All state institutions of higher learning received federal funding, and the Adams case began with a bang of enforcement in the 1970s, many years after the 1954 Brown case, to increase the amount of integration and also to make HBCUs much more equal with their TWIs. In the Adams case, the court identified 10 states that maintained dual systems of higher education as late as the mid-1970s. This group was eventually expanded to include 18 states, in addition suits filed by black plaintiffs against states pursuant to the 14th Amendment of the Equal Protection Clause and Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, created litigation in Alabama, in Louisiana, and in Mississippi. And all of them resulted in settlements to benefit HBCUs and create educational programs that would attract white students for integration. Notwithstanding over a half a century of desegregation integration efforts in education, the law has at least affected few HBCUs in contrast with the progress that was made at the elementary and secondary school levels. Civil rights organizations as well have not devoted much resource to challenging the inequality of HBCUs. And as a result, nearly all of the state-funded HBCUs today 
remain uh, largely racially unbalanced, unequal in educational programs, and far inferior in capital infrastructure consisting of buildings and grounds comparable to their TWIs. This is the state of HBCUs largely today. Now, for the law. In 1992, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called U.S. and Heirs versus Fordyce involving the state of Mississippi. And the Fordyce or Ayers Court case, as it's called, the United States later intervened, so it took on the name of the United States as the plaintiff. But for those who know, it's Ayers. Jake Ayers was the one who brought this challenge in the state of Mississippi in the 19 late 80s, saying that Mississippi still maintained the vestiges and the incidences of the de jure school system in its three historically black colleges and universities, Jackson State in Jackson, Mississippi, Alcorn State, and Mississippi a Valley State. And the Supreme Court held that notwithstanding nearly 20 years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision in terms of the facts in the case, that the plaintiffs could show that if any current policies were traceable to the de jure era that had long ended, it constituted intentional discrimination. And the burden shifted to the state uh, to show that these vestiges of the dual system uh, could not be eliminated by any feasible means, or it was not educationally sound. And one of the key features of these incidences is called the duplication of educational programs. And in the duplication of educational programs, both the facts and the law go like this. If there is a historically black college and university that has an educational program, such as a master's in business administration, and later in time, a traditional white institution wants to create a master of business administration in the same geographic proximity as the HBCU school, this constitutes the duplication of educational services. Why, you may ask, does it constitute a violation of the law if a white institution later wants to create the same program that previously existed at an HBCU? And both the court as well as the sociology answer the question that if the white institution opens up a new program, nearly all whites will attend that program, and mostly blacks will continue to attend the historically black college and university. And thus, the end result is that the duplication of services in the new program by the traditional white institution perpetuates the same racial identification and isolation as it did during the de jure era. And this, the court said, must be remedied by transferring programs, by creating high demand, unique programs at traditionally black institutions that will attract a wide economic and diverse racial and ethnic group of students. And this is the law that has resulted in challenges in Alabama and in Louisiana and Mississippi, as I said, and it's also been a case in Tennessee. And there have been a number of agreements between the Office for Civil Rights and states, such as Florida and in Texas and in Maryland and in Virginia, to remedy this problem. In short, though, even though 20 years after Brown versus Board of Education, nearly all traditionally white institutions integrated by the mid-1970s. Some with litigation in Georgia and Alabama, others voluntary. And today, virtually all former Adams, Jim Crow, South institutions of higher learning have been integrated. And it's just a question of the percentage and level of diversity that's related to the affirmative action question. However, nothing has ever really been done with the historically black colleges and universities 
to keep them competitive and comparable with their traditional white institutions. And I'll leave you with one example with the disclosure that I am one of the counsel in a case in litigation in Maryland right now called the Coalition for Equity and Excellence in Higher Education versus the state of Maryland. In Maryland, there are four historically black colleges and universities, Morgan State University, Coppin State University, and Bowie State University, all within the general proximity of each other in Baltimore and neighboring Mount Montgomery County, and Maryland Eastern Shore, which is down on the shore, used to be known as Maryland State University. And in the Baltimore surrounding area, the following traditionally white institutions exist, consisting of the University of Baltimore and Towson University, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the University of Maryland. And there are basically too many schools in too small a location to be economically and educationally efficient for the future. But they're the creatures, you see, of that sin of Jim Crow segregation that created the dual system of education, and the debt has come due now, and what to do about it. Last October, a federal district court judge in Baltimore named Catherine Blake a rendered decision that found that the state of Maryland violated the Equal Protection Clause and the uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act in maintaining a dual system of higher education, uh, particularly with unnecessary educational programs, uh, largely in the Baltimore County region between the TWIs and the HBCUs. I'll give you just two facts. Number one, the University of Baltimore itself was a duplication because the state of Maryland purchased it around 1970s. It was a two-year college at the upper level of juniors and seniors at a business school and had a law school. But it was if to say, not having freshmen and sophomores didn't duplicate the same educational programs that already existed at Coppin State University and at Morgan State University. Nevertheless, they went on through the years, and they uh, later, in the 2000s, expanded the University of Baltimore to include both freshmen and now sophomores, with the University of Baltimore arguing that it could not survive without the feeder of freshmen and sophomores that go on to become juniors and seniors and uh, graduate. And that, the court said, was a duplication in itself. The second one is that notwithstanding that Maryland has had a half a dozen studies in which it admitted that the HBCUs are unequal, and notwithstanding that it entered into two settlement agreements over 20 years from uh, the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, up into the uh, 2000s, with the U.S. Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights to uh, cure its unequal educational institutions. It came along in the 19, excuse me, in the late 2000s, around 2004-2005, and it approved a master's of business administration program at Towson State University notwithstanding that the state attorney general's office advised that it would be a duplication, that it would be in violation of its existing compact agreement with OCR, when Morgan State previously had a longstanding master's in business administration program that had a highly integrated student body because it was the only MBA program in the city of Baltimore other than the University of Maryland's uh, Master's of Business program in his School of Business. And so, notwithstanding that advice, it nevertheless approved it, and it approved it by trying to get a piggyback on the University of Maryland's business program, which was a duplication itself, in saying that it's not going to be Towson's program, it's going to be the University of Baltimore's program, excuse me. But the Baltimore program, jointly in these articulation agreements, is that one school sends its students to another school to take a, a graduate school course. But they come back to their own school and they get credit, and they graduate from their university with the, uh, with, with the same degree, taking these credits. But Towson said, no, we're going to have our own business program, but we're going to call it Baltimore's. We're still going to teach our students mm -hmm. in our business program at Towson, and they're going to graduate with an MBA from Towson, not from the University of Baltimore, if they call themselves going over there to take courses if they want to enroll in that program. So the court found that all of this was a violation. It stopped short of issuing a remedy. It ordered the parties into mediation, where we are now, 
and the court is probably going to render a judgment finding the state of Maryland in violation and is depending upon the outcome of the uh, mediation, either uh, accept the settlement between the parties or issue their own remedy. I conclude by saying that Thurgood Marshall once said, HBCUs are the moral dilemma of Brown because they continue to exist even to this day, 60 years after Brown, as separate and unequal. And yet there's very little remedy to uh, change that. However, he changed his mind when he learned that HBCUs never excluded whites and that they were always integrated and whites attended HBCUs. Uh, but today, the question of HBCUs in the future is in doubt. And I leave you with the kind of metaphor that just as the best black athletes no longer attend HBCUs because they play for Bama and they play for Georgia and they play for Florida in the swamp, HBCUs are losing the best black brains to integration at their traditional white institutions. So the question is, what will be their future 50 years now? Will they remain or will they dissolve? <laughs>